Friends, we continue our study of Jesus Christ according to the New Testament, in fact, according to the whole Bible. Well, as we have it in, in our Bible course, God's Plan for Man, we pointed out to you the last two times how that Jesus Christ became the Son of God about 1,900 years ago. Now we want to bring to you another thought about Jesus Christ, the kenosis of Christ, K-E-N-O-S-I-S, the kenosis of Christ, as stated by Paul in Philippians 2, 5 to 8. He said, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every knee should bow and every tongue confess, we read here, that Jesus Christ is Lord of the glory of God the Father. Now the kenosis of Christ means that Christ emptied himself. The Greek word for made himself of no reputation in Philippians 2, 7 is kanao, meaning to empty, to evacuate, become nothing, to divest oneself of native dignity and power, and to descend to an inferior position or condition. It is translated made void in Romans 4, 14. Make void. 1 Corinthians 9.15, made of, make of none effect. 1 Corinthians 1.17, and be in vain. 2 Corinthians 9.3. The idea in all these passages, as can readily be seen, is to cause a thing to be seen as empty, hollow, nothing, false, or absolutely useless. God emptied himself. What a strange idea in connection with God. Yes, but through a knowledge of this truth comes a true knowledge of the essence of Christianity and of the very nature and being of God himself. This truth, as demonstrated by God to man, by concrete example, clears God once and forever of all the accusations made against him by the devil and his followers. It personified in God the very opposite of the depraved nature of the devil and those who follow him. When God created the heaven and the earth, he planned that they should be inhabited by free and intelligent peoples with absolute freedom of choice as to their destiny and God-given responsibility to keep the moral laws of the universe. This plan was that all spirit and material beings should be subject to God and love him, not from the principles of fear and suspicion instilled in them by false ideas of a, ty of a tyrannical, oppressive, despotic and ghostly being called God, who was ready to pounce upon them for the least infraction of his moral laws, but that God himself should be the example and ideal to them of all that is just, holy, true, and perfect. God should become the supreme sovereign, ruling for the good of his whole creation and sharing his goodness, power, and glorious being with all alike and that his form of government should be recognized and respected by all alike on all planets. When spirit and human free wills were created, they were inexperienced as to right and wrong and as to the true nature of the great being which had brought them into existence. They were created miniatures of God in attributes and powers and could exercise their powers and attributes like God, but only in a limited and a finite way. They had to learn by experience the free exercise of their faculties as to right and wrong. They had to learn to walk in the ways of God and to be content with their own creative limitations in strict obedience and submission. Being like God in body, soul, and spirit, they could naturally enjoy the same feelings, emotions, and desires as God and have perfect fellowship with Him and their mutual administration of the universe. The many theophanies of God in Scripture reveal and demonstrate the mutual interest and common partnership of God and his created subjects and co-workers. 
Even since the rebellion in God's kingdom, it is God's plan to dwell with men and make men co-administrators of the universe. For in Revelation 21, 3, we read, The tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. We read that the resurrected saints are going to reign with God and help God administer the affairs of the universe forever. For the meek shall inherit the earth. And we have statements in Revelation 20, 1 Corinthians 6, and many other scriptures stating that the saints will reign as kings and priests with Christ, not only for a thousand years, but forever, even forever and ever. Angels were the first to help God administer the affairs of the universe, according to Colossians 1, 15 to 18. Lucifer himself ruled this planet, and through pride fell and invaded heaven to dethrone God, but was defeated and his kingdom destroyed and the earth placed under water and darkness, as we have seen in previous studies in our study of the pre-Adamite world. Lucifer's highest ambition was to be like the Most High in the infinite and the sovereign sense. This spirit of pride and self-exaltation was the very opposite of what the second person of the Godhead demonstrated when he emptied himself and thought it not something to be grasped after to retain equality with God. Since Lucifer fell, he has become the leader of all whose program is self-exaltation and rule or ruin. Someday he will be forced to capitulate and bow the knee to him who demonstrated the opposite principles, who emptied and humbled himself from deity to humanity and from humanity to infamy, and who has been exalted at the right hand of the Father, waiting until his enemies could be made his footstool. In this we have a clear demonstration of the power of the greater and more godlike principles of right over wrong, unselfishness over selfishness, humility over pride, faithfulness and obedience over rebellion, and self-emptying over self-exaltation. When God restored the earth in six days and created new life therein, Man was given the minion that Lucifer lost. Man soon sinned, and after the same subtle manner as did the spirit rebels by attempting to be equal with God in the unlawful sense. It was Satan using the serpent as a tool who said, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing both good and evil. Thus Adam, like Lucifer, before him, through trying to be as Elohim in the unlawful sense, really became unlike God in the lawful sense. He became the leader of all human rebels against God, as Lucifer had become the devil and leader of all spirit rebels before Adam. At the fall, Lucifer took up, took up his new role as the usurper, pseudo-ruler of man in his dominion, and he offered his dominion to Jesus Christ in the time of temptation in the wilderness, but was rejected. Man entered his new role as a beaten galley slave, no longer able to resist his slave master and exercise his God-given dominion or his faculties in freedom from sin and the devil. God, who always has had and always will have the best interests of his creatures at heart, saw the unequal struggle and helpless state of his new creation and began to champion man's cause and make it possible for man to defeat the spirit rebels and regain his dominion. God knew that the spirit rebels were past redemption, having refused all means of reconciliation before he took action against them. God further knew that the new rebels should be given full justice and the chance to become reconciled before having final action taken against them. So as pre-planned, the Creator offered redemption to all human rebels, especially to them who accept and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. The first step in the work of redemption was to send angels to protect the new race from immediate destruction by the spirit rebels who wanted to annihilate the race and seize the earth for themselves. The age-long struggle between these good and bad forces for the protection and destruction of the race until the restitution of all things is clearly revealed in dozens and dozens of Scripture. The second step was the promise of a Redeemer who would come as the seed of the woman and who would liberate man from the slavery of the devil and free and restore his original dominion. 
man was then to become head over all again. Many are the promises of the virgin-born child who would be God manifest in the flesh and who would be the firstborn of both God and Mary to head the new creation of humankind and who would finally put down Satan and bring man's dominion back to himself. The third step was the actual fulfillment of Emmanuel, God with us. What kind of being was God to be when he appeared among men? What kind of an example and life was he to demonstrate before and among men in order to win them from allegiance to the devil? What could he possibly do to allay the fears and wrong impressions of God in man and counteract the arguments against God and his rights and bring man over on God's side? Was he going to be a Satan picture to him? <coughs> a being full of pride, a tyrant, a despot full of vengeance? ready to destroy those who rebel? Was he to come in might and power to inspire all and demand the worship of all? Was he to come from his faithful hosts or with them and conquer Satan and his rebels in the sight of man and to prove man that he alone was powerful enough to be sovereign of all? Was he coming to save himself or to restore others? These are many questions that we must answer, and we can answer them. We can answer that he came as a man, a lowly servant, an example of what God wants us all to be like. He came to live like God among men. He literally emptied himself and took the form of a servant and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And he emptied himself from deity to humani humanity and from humanity to infamy, taking on him the sins of the world and redeeming fallen man to his original dominion.